Welcome to another Advanced Manufacturing Media Webinar. Our presentation today is 3D Printed Rapid Tools for Injection Molding. Thanks for joining us. Hello, I'm Jim Sawyer, Executive Editor at Manufacturing Engineering. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to provide some background on what we will be doing. Our sponsor today is Stratasys Incorporated. The first person we will hear from is Kim Killeran of Stratasys. She will provide insight into the company and review what additive manufacturing is all about. Following that, Kim will introduce our presenter, Nadav Sala, Solution Sales Manager, Global Field Operations at Stratasys. He manages solution sales for the tooling market. Nadav has a BS in Mechanical Engineering from Tel Aviv University and an MBA from Bar Ilan University. Kim's introduction and the presentation by Nadav have been pre-recorded. While that means any questions you have will not be answered during this webinar, please be aware that you may still ask questions. We'll collect them and pass them along to Stratasys and answers will be emailed to you. To ask a question, simply use the Q&A box that appears on the right side of the screen. Another housekeeping point. As often happens when viewing videos over the Internet, the quality of the presentation can be affected by the type of Internet connection you have, the amount of total bandwidth available, and the number of people accessing that bandwidth at the time. If you experience difficulty, please let us know by way of the Q&A box. The presentation is pre-recorded, but will be with you live all the way through. Now, if you have any questions about other aspects of our webinars, please feel free to email me at jsawyer at sme.org. I'll rejoin you after the presentation with a few concluding remarks. Now, here's Kim Killeran of Stratasys. Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, 3D Printed Rapid Tools for Injection Molding. My name is Kim Kaloran, and I'll be your host for today, today's event. Before we get into today's topic, I wanted to give you a brief overview of Stratasys. For those of you who aren't familiar with our company, Stratasys manufactures 3D printing equipment and materials that create physical objects directly, directly from digital data. Its systems range from affordable desktop 3D printers to larger and more advanced 3D production systems. We are passionate believers in the value and power of 3D printing and in the change it can bring to the world. All Stratasys 3D printers build parts layer by layer. PolyJet technology, known for its smooth, detailed surfaces and ability to combine multiple materials in one part, employs an inkjet style method to build parts from liquid photopolymers in fine droplets immediately cured then with a UV light. We also have FDM technology, which is fused deposition modeling. It's known for its reliability and durable parts. And what it does is it extrudes fine lines of molten thermal plastic, which then solidify as they're deposited. The Stratasys uh, portfolio of specially engineered 3D printing materials is the most comprehensive in the industry. It includes nearly 150 polyjet photopolymers and FDM thermal plastics. So now on to uh, the meat of today's event. I'd like to welcome our presenters, Nadav Sela, Solutions Sales Manager and Global Field Operations for Stratasys. And Nadav has been working in Stratasys for six years. He started as an application engineer at Object, then managed the pre-sales and applications for the emerging markets, including Latin America, and he is currently managing the solution sales worldwide for the tooling market. He started working on developing the market for printed tools for injection molding over four years ago while still at Object. And prior to that, he worked five years in the semiconductors industry as a project manager. He has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Tel Aviv University and an MBA from Bar Leon University. So Nadav, at this point, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, uh, Kim. Okay, so uh, hello, everybody. Um, today, uh, I'll try to give you a brief uh, overview on our uh, very exciting application of uh, printing uh, molds for injection molding. Uh, we call it uh, PIMPT, uh, just for uh, uh, shortening the long phrase. 
So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what is it good for using uh, printing, uh, uh, printed injection molding tools, uh, where does it fit, uh, giving uh, flexibility in the prototype manufacturing, which is, uh, I think, the main advantage of uh, this application. Uh, we'll show you some sample parts and uh, the benefits from these sample parts in terms of uh, saving uh, time and money and uh, showing you some uh, tips and tricks uh, to do successful molding with the uh, printing injection molds. After that, at the end, we'll have some uh, questions and hopefully some answers for you. So, printed injection molding tools, what is it good for? So, usually, um, as uh, Kim said, uh, I came from uh, starting as an application engineer and uh, doing a lot of benchmarks for, uh, for prospects and customers. So in this slide, you can see uh, a, a diagram of the product design life cycle where everything starts uh, with the CAD design, uh, where you get your ideas. Uh, usually you do some, uh, some iterations in the CAD and uh, look how the model or how your part looks and functions. <clears throat> then uh, companies go and manufacture usually what we call prototype one, which is a more concept uh, prototype uh, used for uh, a visual appreciation of, uh, of your design, uh, uh, just to, you know, to get a feel on how, how the product uh, looks like. And usually this uh, prototype is uh, manufactured uh, using a rapid prototype, uh, prototyping machines, uh, uh, usually the surface finish is important here, and uh, mainly the visual appreciation. After a few iterations of uh, prototype one, where uh, companies can uh, go back to the CAD and change some, uh, change some uh, things, uh, uh, further down the road, companies need usually to create what we call prototype two, which is a functional prototype, uh, most likely uh, manufactured from the real end product material, and is designed to get uh, the company the ability to do the full range tests on the, on the part uh, before starting a production or before investing a lot of time and money uh, in, manufactured, in manufacturing uh, steel or aluminum tools. So basically, uh, <clears throat> what we say is that the rapid molds uh, solution comes here in manufacturing prototype number two which is the functional prototype from the real end product uh, material. So I would like you to watch this video uh, from one of our customers in uh, Europe. And here you can see actually uh, a propeller, uh, a cooling propeller for an electric engine. And here we can see the mold uh, printed on our Connex machine. This mold is printed in uh, 22 hours and uh, costs uh, less than $1,000. You can see the, the mold uh, uh, is, after the printing, is taken out of the, uh, the printer and mounted on a standout 70-ton uh, uh, Arbog injection molding machine. You can see that the part is actually uh, injected uh, into the mold, and the mold is mounted on the machine, uh, and the injection is done through a standard metal bushing that is, uh, runs through a back plate here. The mold is being removed after the uh, injection, and the part is taken out uh, from the mold. So basically, you get a fully functional uh, POM, acetal or delarin, uh, as, you, as uh, usually it's called in the U.S., uh, you get a time saving of between 700 and 1800 uh, percent and cost saving between 40 to 80 percent versus uh, aluminum or steel. Um, now, this part was done uh, for uh, the functional tests at the end uh, of the product uh, uh, design uh, life cycle uh, at the point where as I mentioned before, uh, prototype number two uh, was needed to do all the functional tests with the very high uh, velocity spinning of that propeller uh, to make sure that uh, the design met uh, the requirements that were asked by the customer, meaning uh, reduced uh, noise and 
uh, increase the uh, cooling efficiency. <clears throat> so once we got to this point, uh, where hopefully everybody understands uh, what we're talking about here, meaning uh, printing uh, molds and injecting real thermoplastics in the mold, uh, probably one of the questions that you all ask yourself is, uh, where does it fit? Uh, can I do any material? Can I inject any material into the, into the, the mold? Uh, how many parts can I get out of the mold? What is the accuracy? Uh, all these questions uh, we'll try to answer in the following uh, slides. So the best fit for this uh, solution will be thermoplastics with uh, molding temperatures of up to 300 degrees Celsius, which is... Uh, uh, 570 degrees Fahrenheit, a, glue, a good flowability, and candidates like uh, plastics uh, that you probably all know, like polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, ABS, uh, TPEs, polyamide, uh, POM, which is Delarine, the, the example we just saw, and PCABS, and also some uh, glass field raisins like polypropylene with the uh, glass stream post or a nylon with glass reinforced. In terms of the quantities here, uh, we're talking about uh, low quantities uh, that we get out of the mold, and this is, again, uh, just to get you your first prototypes from the real-end product material that you can use for your functional uh, testing of your, product, uh, of your parts. So we're talking about between 5 to 100 parts, and again, it depends on the complexity of the part and the material you're going to inject. Of course, if you're injecting uh, very high melting point materials like uh, glass field nylons, uh, or uh, you are injecting a, a good uh, flowability and low melting point uh, plastics like polypropylene, uh, the amount of parts that you can get out of the mold will be, uh, will be different. We're talking about here on uh, mid-sized parts, uh, less than uh, 165 uh, cubic centimeters or uh, less than 10 cubic inches. And the machine type that you can use here, you can use from a bench plastic injection molding machine, uh, like the one uh, probably some of you saw in school, uh, engineering school or plastic engineering school, up to machines of uh, 50 to 100 ton uh, standard molding machine from uh, any manufacturer that uh, you are working with. Here you can see on the right some examples of uh, injected parts. Uh, the upper example was done by one of our customers, Nitro Healthcare, uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, they did the project for three months evaluating this process, and they own a, a Connex machine as well. Uh, you can read about it in the white paper we, we published uh, in the website if you'd like uh, further. And you can see on the bottom right, you can see a mold from uh, one of our customers in Germany, an automotive uh, part manufacturer. It's a very, very complex mold uh, that was done uh, to reduce time and cost uh, to get the first functional parts uh, to testing. And we have a movie about that as well that you can watch on uh, YouTube if you like. Now, when we're talking about uh, printed injection molding tools, uh, as I said, we're talking about flexibility in the prototype manufacturing. So basically, it all comes down to uh, the prototyping manager uh, or the R&D manager um, to make a decision on how to produce a part at a certain point in time uh, in, uh, in different projects. So there are a few routes that you can, uh, you can take, and I will elaborate a, li a little bit uh, further down the, the presentation in the next slide. But basically, you can see... Uh, a kind of a decision here made uh, to choose between rapid molds, which, which are fast, uh, cheap, and can get you a low volume of parts, uh, between CNC, which is uh, slower uh, to manufacture, more expensive, but will give you a large volume of parts. So this is one of the decision points where you would need to uh, weigh in all the, the factors, meaning how many parts you need, uh, for, the, uh, for the process, is the surface finish uh, uh, very important or not so, uh, not so important? And by making the right decisions, you can save time and money and give uh, your company flexibility in your prototype manufacturing from the real-end uh, product material. 
let's review the last uh, let's say the last comment in the in the next three slides. So what you can see here is uh, a graph that uh, incorporates all the players that can uh, help a company uh, uh, create prototypes uh, from the real end product material. So uh, representing the, let's say, the additive manufacturing world is the, is the FDM here. You have a plastic part fabrication, which is a direct milling of parts uh, from a plastic uh, block by CNC. You have prototype injection molding, which is milling uh, an aluminum mold uh, and then injecting the parts in the mold. You have surplus injection molding, which is uh, taking or buying uh, an existing mold and modifying it to, uh, uh, to accommodate uh, your new part. And we have conventional injection molding, which is uh, milling uh, a mold from steel uh, using CNC, EDM, or other uh, other possibilities. Basically, it will be probably CNC and EDM. So, what you see here now in the in the golden rectangle is placing the printed injection molded solution in the realm of all the other players in the market, and showing you where does this solution fit in terms of the x and y axis here in this uh, in this table. So on the x-axis, you have the initial cost uh, of the method uh, that you, you see in the graph. And on the y-axis, you have the marginal cost of uh, creating or producing another part. So as you can see, uh, quite uh, obviously, conventional injection molding will have a very high initial cost, but the marginal cost will be very, very low in terms of how much it will cost uh, to produce the third prototype, the fourth prototype, or part and the fifth and so on. So once you get the, the injection mold or you, you milled it from steel, it will cost a lot of money, but the cost of creating additional parts will be very, very low. On the other hand, you have the FDM, which has a very high marginal cost, but a very low initial cost. So in the golden rectangle, you can see where uh, the printed injection molds uh, come. They have an initial cost uh, much less than uh, conventional injection molding, surplus injection molding, and sometimes uh, plastic pass fabrication and prototype injection molding. And they have a, a marginal cost which is less than directly uh, printing apart from FDM or any other, other uh, additive manufacturing uh, uh, method. And of course, you get the final part from the real end product material in a um, in the end, uh, so in the end, in the end process that uh, you will, you're going to use uh, to manufacture your end product, which will probably be injection molded. Uh, just to note that this data was taken from a study done by uh, Toyota and uh, Yuma Snow uh, some many years ago, and uh, what I did here is just uh, put an overlay uh, on this uh, graph to show you how. Um, how the plastic, the printed injection molding tools uh, come in hand with the other uh, solutions uh, in the market. In this slide, you can see uh, two different axes uh, to show uh, the same uh, uh, the same issue here or the same uh, uh, problem that everyone faces when uh, deciding how to produce a part. So here you have on the x-axis the initial tooling time and on the y-axis, the marginal production time. So the initial tooling time, as you can see, will be much lower than conventional injection molding and prototype injection molding and surplus. And the marginal production time will be lower with printed injection molds than plastic part fabrication and FDM. In the last slide from this study, you can see how uh, the printed injection molding tool come uh, relative to the number of parts that you can obtain from a mold and the part complexity. So as you can see, of course, uh, very, very complex parts uh, with a lot of moving parts in the mold, uh, um, uh, of course, cannot be manufactured, but uh, relatively complex parts uh, with low quantities uh, can be manufactured with the printed injection molding tools uh, with a lower cost and a lower time. 
<clears throat> Here you can see in a, in a maybe more clear uh, graphical way, you can see uh, where the solution comes uh, relative to other solutions uh, to produce molds that uh, are available in the market. So you can see uh, steel and aluminum tools, uh, direct metal tinkering tools, cast resin tools, usually epoxy. And here you can see the polyjet tools in terms of how many parts you can get relative to the material you are going to inject into the mold. In terms of the material that you are going to inject in the mold, we divided the plastic world into four groups uh, from A to B, where A is the most easy uh, plastics to inject, and B will be the most difficult plastics to inject in terms of melting point, viscosity, and other parameters. So you can see that in group A, uh, materials like polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, ABS, and, and the whole PPE family, which is a very important group here, are very easy to inject and you can uh, expect to obtain relative a uh, large number of, of parts uh, from a single printed uh, mold. Just as an example, uh, T the PPE family is a family that is very hard to simulate uh, when using uh, additive manufacturing. And uh, in my uh, Let's say in my experience as an application engineer, most of the companies find it very difficult to simulate TPEs and get them uh, as functional prototypes to, to run a functional test if it's in the automotive industry, for example, uh, under the hood applications, high temperatures, and so on. So here, actually, you can get a TPE part from the real and product material very quick. Group number B, like polypropylene with glass fibers, nylon, uh, POM and PCABS, which is again uh, just a few examples of that. This group, and also Group C, uh, is possible um, using a reinforced nylon or polycarbonate uh, parts. Uh, we can do as well. But as I said before, you can see that the number of parts that you, you can expect to obtain from a mold uh, decreases when you get to the higher uh, or tougher. And it appears to inject in, that, in, in, in those groups as we uh, showed. I would like to show you some examples uh, of parts that uh, were injected to give you some, uh, uh, let's say, some live images of uh, the things that we just uh, discussed. So here you can see a three part mold uh, uh, of a part taken out of a, a pump. You can see uh, parts molded to the same mold uh, from acetal, uh, from reinforced polypropylene with 20% uh, glass fibers, uh, EPDM, and also some uh, nylon 66 with 20% uh, uh, glass reinforced. In this slide, you can see the molding temperature for each one of the materials that you saw in the last slide. Uh, this can be, can be used for, uh, as a reference uh, for you the, if you if you would like to try it or uh, just compare it to uh, the molding uh, the molding uh, parameters that you know from each material. And here you can see an example in the picture of where this part uh, came from in terms of uh, which product. This part is again, as I said, is uh, quite a difficult part because of the thickness of the plastic and also because there is an undercut uh, with the threads of, uh, of the, this uh, cork. In this example, you can see a relatively easy part. Uh, this is an ice cream spoon. That uh, This is actually a production mold that was uh, printed from uh, the digital ABS material on our Connex machine. Uh, you can see two different examples here of uh, mounting the mold on the injection molding machine. Again, this is a, here again, it's an album machine, standard 70-ton uh, machine. Uh, in this part, you can see that uh, we managed to, uh, you can get a relatively high number of parts from the mold uh, because the mold is quite, uh, the material here is uh, polypropylene. It's quite easy to uh, to inject, and we were very very easily we got around 600 parts uh, from uh, from the mold with no uh, any uh, visible degradation of the mold. You can see the time saving and cost saving here, uh, which is uh, substantial. 
time saving queue was uh, 3,000 percent, and the cost saving queue was uh, 44 percent over aluminum and 75 percent over steel. Uh, the numbers here uh, were taken from uh, two different uh, tool makers that we asked uh, to get the price proposal uh, and, uh, of course, the, the lead time. And uh, this was done, uh, this project, specific project was done in Brazil, so the price offers uh, and time also, the lead time was taken from uh, two different Brazilian uh, tool makers. The next example is from one of our customers in uh, Europe, an automotive uh, uh, parts manufacturer uh, named Seufer. Again, uh, uh, you saw this part in the last slides, uh, a few slides ago, and uh, you can watch a video, a, cu a customer testimonial video from this customer as well in YouTube. As you can see, this part is very, very complex, and uh, when you will watch the video, you, you will see that the uh, uh, conventional production mode of this part cost about 40,000 uh, euros, which is probably about uh, $55,000. And uh, the mold that they, they printed here uh, was printed in one day, and the injection was done on uh, the day after. So they actually could get the functional part uh, in their hands uh, the day after uh, they started printing. Uh, this part was injected in few materials. Uh, we injected it from... Uh, a high density polyethylene, we injected it uh, from polypropylene and as well from uh, reinforced, uh, reinforced nylon. This is another example here, a part from ABS, uh, injected in ABS. This is from one of our customers in, uh, in the UK. Um, you can see again the injection parameters here, the nozzle temperature, injection pressure, holding pressure and uh, other parameters. This part was challenging because of the deep uh, bosses that, uh, that you can see here. And you can see, uh, for example, in the red part, you can see that the boss is closed. And on the black part, you can see that the boss is fully open and, uh, and correct. Um, the reason is that uh, they use the metal insert uh, to create those uh, very uh, thin uh, long bosses uh, incorporated in the printed uh, tool. Another interesting point here on this part is that uh, after they injected this part, they saw that they have a venting problem in the tool design and some of the ribs here were not full. And this actually uh, showed them that when they come to manufacture the end product tool, they will need to add the sufficient venting uh, uh, to make uh, to make those ribs uh, uh, fully functional. Uh, this is again another uh, advantage of using the printed tools uh, to catch uh, uh, design errors uh, before the real end product modes uh, production starts. The next example here is the test parts that we have done uh, in order to make sure that we are on spec in terms of the dimensional uh, properties of the part after injection. Uh, we've done a lot of tests on this part and uh, measured uh, different points after uh, 20, 50, and 100 uh, shots uh, uh, to the mold. You have some uh, very typical features in injection molding in this part. You have uh, uh, boss with ribs and without ribs, you have a snap fit here, and you have a very uh, common uh, living hinge here uh, that is uh, very, very hard to simulate uh, in additive manufacturing. And here, of course, the molded material is polypropylene uh, that is perfect for, uh, for living hinges. So again, to create a functional part with living hinge, it's much, much easier uh, to use the end product material like polypropylene and inject it into a printed mold in uh, one day. Um, in terms of the uh, dimensional, uh, dimensional properties here, so we found that we are in spec in terms of the industry standards. Uh, this, the uh, deviation is uh, between uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeters, uh, which should be uh, about three thousandths of an inch, between three thousandths of an inch to six thousandths of an inch. In the next example, you can see uh, the propeller that we saw before in the video. 
this is from a case study we have with one of our customers uh, in Europe, uh, Budapest University. You can read all about it in the website. Basically, you can see also the time saving and cost saving for this project, was, which was uh, between 700 and 1800 percent in terms of time, and between uh, 43 to 72 percent uh, in terms of cost versus aluminum uh, and steel. This is the POM part, by the way. This is the injection parameters of the POM part. In the next example, uh, this is one example of uh, PPE materials uh, injected into a printed, uh, uh, printed mold. And you can see the quote from our customer uh, saying that compared to silicon molding, 50% in time and cost are saved, as well as the real material prototype made. Uh, this is parts for the automotive industry. And again, as I said before, uh, TPEs or rubber-like parts are very hard to, uh, to simulate, uh, either using silicon molding and then you get the parts from polyurethane, but it takes time, it takes money, and at the, at the end you don't get the real uh, part in your hand or the real, uh, uh, real material in your hand. So here, again, it's a very, very big advantage. Now, after seeing the examples, I would like to talk a little bit about some tips and tricks uh, on how actually to, uh, to perform injection uh, into printed tools. So, it all starts with the mold design, uh, and again, we have a very detailed white paper in terms of uh, all the tips and tricks and uh, 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 showing uh, customers uh, what to change uh, in the mold design and in the process uh, to make a, su a successful uh, injection. Uh, so I would like to go through a few uh, tips and tricks here, um, and let's start uh, with the, the mold design or the tool design. So in terms of the gate, basically what we, what we, what we would like is uh, to reduce as much as possible the temperature and the pressure uh, going into the printed tool. Um, so we would like to use uh, a screw gate or an edge gate uh, when we design a, a tool uh, to be uh, used with uh, our Connex machine or printed, uh, uh, printed in uh, 3D. We would like to increase the gate size uh, over traditional uh, gate sizes to minimize the stress here. So we don't recommend a tunnel gate, cache gate, banana gate, and point gate. So try to uh, try to stay with a screw gate, a screw gate or edge gate. In terms of the draft angle and shutoffs. So uh, to facilitate, uh, facilitate the injection, injection of the part from the mold, we would uh, recommend to increase the draft angle when possible or if possible uh, up to a maximum of uh, five degrees. And to inset the shot of faces uh, due to the printer tolerance, which is uh, 0 0.1 millimeter or a little bit uh, better than that with the small parts, um, to uh, to to make sure that you have a good fit uh, in the in the shot of uh, faces. So inside the shot of faces, uh, about 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 uh, millimeter uh, uh, before uh, you print uh, the mold. Here you can see some uh, pictures on where exactly do I mean uh, to insert. Uh, the shot of faces. <clears throat> Regarding the mold components, so the, for the ejection system, uh, we recommend to undersize the ejection holes. The ejection holes, of course, can be designed, of course, with, with the mold design, like you do in a regular uh, steel mold, but undersize them by 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 millimeters, and after the printing, rim them uh, to get the perfect fit. The cooling cycle, uh, if used, locate it uh, about 8 to 10 millimeters below the cavity surface. So 
If you are going to use cooling channels, and again, uh, one point to mention here is that uh, cooling channels uh, work uh, with the printing tools, but are, of course, much less efficient in cooling the mold, uh, cooling a plastic mold, in this case a thermoset mold, uh, than cooling a steel mold. So in terms of your expectations, uh, do not expect that it will have the same cooling effect as you would have in a steel mold. Uh, but our experiments show that it helps, but it doesn't have a very big effect. So if you use it, locate the cooling channels about 8 to 10 millimeters below uh, the cavity surface. Here you can see some examples in the bottom right uh, of uh, the mold you saw before with cooling channels uh, incorporated. It says here that it's not recommended, and uh, again, this is uh, because the uh, the heat flow uh, the heat flow ratio here or the heat flow uh, uh, rate here uh, is uh, is not as high as with the steel tools. Here you can see a picture of the uh, the mold design uh, showing uh, the red holes for the ejection uh, ejection pins and uh, the green holes for the holes to mount the mold on the injection molding machine. The mold fitting and finishing. So you can see here uh, what we mentioned before uh, to rim. Uh, the ejection system holds. Okay, in terms of the mold, uh, in terms of the mold base option, uh, you want to make sure that the mold uh, sticks out about 0.2 millimeters or eight thousandths of an inch uh, beyond uh, the mold base. This is to uh, make sure that when you clamp the mold, you will have a tight clamping uh, between uh, the two mold halves. You can see on the bottom right uh, the ejection, ejection system fit after the rimming. In terms of the finishing, the surface finishing, so you can see two examples here, one uh, uh, colored in red and one colored in green. So the red colored surface is the surface that you might want to, uh, uh, to, finish, uh, uh, to finish in order to uh, facilitate the ejection of the part from the mold after the injection. The green area is an area that you might want to finish uh, just to make uh, a better surface finish to your injected, the injected part. Both of them can be done with standard uh, sandpaper, starting with a, a 180 to 220 grid, uh, followed by up to uh, 2,000 grid uh, of uh, sandpaper to finish the mold. The mounting option of the mold uh, on the injection molding machine, so as we said before, uh, you can mount the mold uh, even on a, on a bench press, and this option is not shown in the pictures here. But in terms of standard injection molding machine or industrial injection molding machine, so we have a few opportunities. You have the opportunity to put the mold in a mold base, uh, which most of our customers are uh, just uh, creating a, a mold base with the standard size that usually they would use uh, for their inserts, uh, meaning that uh, they think about the standard part size that uh, they will usually use and then create the mold base uh, to accommodate uh, the insert that would then would be printed. Uh, the insert is uh, the same size every time, and just the part is different uh, in the insert. So this way you can uh, switch between inserts very easily, and you have the mold base ready, uh, ready for use whenever you want to, uh, to print an insert and uh, use the printed tool. Uh, the second option here uh, is to uh, use a steel plate uh, with ejection. Uh, in the last case of the mold base, again, the ejection system uh, can, uh, can and is used uh, usually. So in the bottom, you can see a, mold, uh, a steel plate with ejection system. And the third option uh, can be 
just to mount it uh, directly on the back plate like you saw in the movie with the propeller. Now, the advantage here is that it's the easiest, let's say, easiest and cheapest way uh, to mount the mold on the injection molding machine, but the disadvantage is that you will need to uh, remove the mold uh, after you make, uh, uh, after you inject uh, each shot uh, to remove the part, to, to eject the part. The mold is uh, glued with a two-side tape here on the back plate, and again, the molding itself is done through a standard metal bushing uh, that runs through uh, the back plate uh, up to the mold. As you can see, the mold here is closed with the with the cello tape, and uh, after the clamping position is uh, set, uh, the clamping force is applied and the part uh, is injected. In terms of the process development, so we would recommend the conservative uh, settings to maximize, to maximize the, the tool uh, life. Start with a very low pressure and temperature, do some test runs, inspect the results, and adjust as needed. In the picture here, you can see the test shots uh, to dial in the parameters uh, with the part that you saw from the sulfur case study. So the initial settings here uh, is setting the injection molding time limit to 20 seconds, setting the pack and hold phase to uh, zero pressure and zero seconds, of course, at the uh, process development stage, setting the shot size to 70% of the standard uh, volume, and the barrel temperature at the low end of the resin uh, recommendation. The injection speed should be at the low end of the resin recommendation and 10 to 20% of the machine's maximum screw speed. The cooling size, uh, cycle sorry, uh, should be uh, sm for small and thin parts about 40 seconds and for larger parts or thicker features uh, 90 seconds. Of course, you, you should inspect the parts uh, after the first few shots uh, just uh, uh, according to your uh, findings. Okay. Now, in terms of the trial shots, increase the shot size. Uh, target is 90% of the, uh, the part volume or the shot volume. Adjust the packing pressure to 30 to 50% of the injection pressure and increase holding time until you get uh, a perfect part. If you see some sink marks, sink marks at the part, sorry, so adjust the barrel temperature, injection speed, and uh, inspect the results again until you get a, a, a nice, smooth, and uh, a fully filled uh, part. Do not overcool the part. It will cause uh, the part to shrink uh, and uh, to grab the tool. Again, you can uh, facilitate the injection, as we said before, uh, by polishing uh, 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 polishing the tool in the in the let's say in the problematic areas that you, you are afraid that uh, the part can uh, uh, grab the tool and uh, interfere with the injection injection of the of the part. Regarding the cooling, so it's very important to cool the tool down. Uh, between uh, between each shot, or basically making sure that the tool will uh, the tool temperature will not rise over 50 degrees Celsius or 120 Fahrenheit. Uh, our best practice is to uh, cool the tool with uh, compressed air. In this picture here on the right, you can see a compressed air uh, a, a compressed air jig mounted on on the injection molding machine and uh, set automatically to, uh, uh, to cool the tool down bet between each shot for uh, a, a period of time, uh, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and then uh, the next inj inj uh, injection cycle uh, uh, takes place. Great. Well, thank you very much, Nadav. Um, do you want to give, you know, a a uh, 30 second summary about the benefits of uh, using this process for injection molding? Yeah, uh, thank you, Kim. So, 
Yeah, basically, I would like to summarize and say uh, uh, what I said at the beginning. So that I think that in a world that everyone uh, everyone is running and uh, looking for new solutions to uh, uh, to try and uh, cut time and cut cost, I think this solution gives uh, wonderful flexibility to manufacturers uh, to uh, to use it uh, whenever possible and to cut time and cut cost. So having a print, uh, let's say a part, injection part in uh, one to two days if you have the machine in-house and uh, maybe in one week if you are uh, using an external provider um, gives you the possibility to move some of your projects into printed tools and at the end uh, cut your overall uh, tooling cost and time and uh, make yourself available for other projects or uh, uh, or just you know, cut your uh, your business uh, uh, costs and uh, make it make it better at the end. Uh, thank you, Kim. Yeah, I think that uh, this is uh, this is it, and uh, we have some more information on the website, as I said, in videos. So uh, we can maybe refer uh, refer the guys to this uh, if they need more information. Thank you, Nadav, for your presentation. In a minute, we'll take any questions that have come in from attendees. And if anyone has a question, please be sure to submit it through the Q&A panel or chat panels, and we'll try and get to it. I wanted to let you know uh, that after the event, you can download a copy of the slides and the recording of this webinar at stratasys.com slash webinar dash injection molding. Uh, now on to the Q&A. I see that a few questions have come through, and we'll try to get through most of these before our time runs out. Um, Larry is asking, uh, does this process give more freedom for like a redesign than the traditional process, and, and how does that work? Um, I think that it gives an advantage in, ser in terms of the time that you can obtain a mold and test your new parts. So I guess that uh, uh, most likely people would think uh, uh, would think think it through very carefully if they would like to. Uh, uh, manufacture a new injection molding or a new injection mold in a conventional way in terms of steel or aluminum because it costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time. Now, when you can actually reprint your injection mold in one uh, one day or overnight and test your new part the next day, I think that it, it will give uh, more freedom to designers when they don't uh, need to uh, spend so much money in getting the new mold and testing the new part. So, yes. All right, so here's another question. Um, Chuck is asking, what are the 3D printing materials that are best suited to print the molds? Okay, good question. So uh, the, the, best, the best material that we have uh, so far or at the moment to print the printed molds is the di digital ABS, which is available on our Conex platform uh, because it's the, tougher, uh, the toughest and the, the highest uh, temperature-resistant uh, material that we have. Uh, although some of our customers use uh, the full Q720 material and also some of our Vero materials uh, on our desktop and uh, Eden systems uh, to print the, the, the molds. Okay, great. And um, as a side note, I know um, if you need, want more information about materials uh, from Stratasys, specifically the ones that Nadav is, is talking about, you can go to stratasys.com and there's a section on there for materials. Um, and then there's another question here from Sue. It is, where can I get the white paper that was referred to? And actually, I'll answer that one as, as well. If you go to uh, stratasys.com, under the resources section, there is a uh, link for white papers. It's on there. Um, let me see. It's called Precision Prototyping, the Role of 3D Printed Molds in the Injection Molding in Industry. And we'll also have a link to it on um, the URL stratasys.com slash webinar dash injection molding where you can also find today's um, webinar slides and the webinar recording. So one more question. Gloria is asking, what are the benefits of using 3D printed molds? Okay, so uh, in short, the, the benefits are a significant cost and time saving. Uh, plus greater design freedom, <clears throat> and uh, finally, it gives manufacturers the ability to create uh, product prototypes from the re from the same materials used uh, to create the final product. And this is the uh, this is the the major advantage here. Great. 
All right. So again, um, a reminder, just check out www.stratasys.com slash webinar dash injection molding for the webinar slides and the, and the recording. Um, also check out the videos on YouTube, which are, are pretty easy to get to. If you just search in injection molding and Stratasys, the first three on there um, are, are great uh, videos to learn more. And then we also have a case study on uh, stratasys.com uh, with Budapest University that helps uh, summarize and show how this process works. So it looks like our time is about up. If we didn't get to your question on the call, we will be sure to follow up with you afterwards via email. Thanks again to Nadav for your great insights on injection molding, and thank you to all the attendees for your attention during the presentation. Now I will turn it over to our operator who will close out the event. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Jim Sawyer joining you again. As I mentioned earlier, this was a pre-recorded presentation, and thus the questions you just heard asked and answered were pre-recorded as well. Any questions that you have submitted today about the contents of the presentation will not be answered during the few minutes remaining to us, but they will be passed on to Stratasys for answering, and you can expect to get that answer via email. Also, if you began listening after the presentation began, the entire webinar will be available for replay uh, shortly after 4 p.m. this afternoon Eastern Time. You can access that on-demand version of the webinar by using the same sign-in link you used to join us uh, just now. Additive manufacturing is really a hot topic these days, and a lot of people don't realize how long it's been around. Um, as innovative as it is, um, it is uh, a few decades old, and Advanced Manufacturing Media's parent organization, SME, has been involved with this developing technology for decades. For instance, SME's Rapid Technologies and Additive Manufacturing Community has been serving and supporting Additive 3D and Rapid for 25 years. In addition, SME has a number of events during the next few months in which Additive Manufacturing will be featured. These include HUSTEX, February 24th through 26th in Houston, AeroDef, April 20th through 23rd in Dallas, East Tech, May 12th through 14th in Springfield, Massachusetts. And uh, SME will host the 22nd Annual Rapid Event, May 18th through the 21st in Long Beach, California. Rapid is North America's definitive additive, additive manufacturing event. Additive manufacturing also receives extensive coverage in Manufacturing Engineering Magazine. Past articles may be found in our digital archive at sme.org slash digitalmemag. Plus, you can find the latest rapid and additive manufacturing news and information on our website at www.advancedmanufacturing.org. We really appreciate the fact that you joined us today, and we hope you found the presentation informative. Take care.